I just thought it might be kind of, well, to begin with, I should say, um, you came up with the title for the sidebar, which was uh, Teabagging in the Kitchen Sink. Yeah, well, teabagging was a sexual act I kind of introduced in uh, Pecker. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's when people hit you in the forehead with their balls. It's actually a safe sex act. You can't get pregnant. And uh, it's a fleeting moment, but uh, it sort of caught on. And then the, the Republicans called themselves teabaggers, which they didn't realize. They didn't know about that term. So in America, the news teams would start laughing sometimes when they were talking about teabaggers because they knew. So uh, I wanted to use that. And then... Uh, when I was young, kitchen sink dramas, were, I always heard of them. They were like British films that took place when the working class had showed the drama of their lives. And they were always adult dramas, like Room at the Top and those kind of movies, which made a really big impression on me when I was 12 years old. So I wanted to mix those two genres kind of together. I mean, the other title that we didn't use in the end, but I remember you were very keen on, was Yank Wank. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Because it's, you know, movies that I really like. And, and, and you know, I guess, um, I don't know how many people are yanking to any of these movies, but maybe, maybe, you never know. So a few of the ones I remember um, didn't quite make it, and it's, it's fitting at the moment with Legend having just hit the screen, but The Craze yeah. was one of the ones. Well, I love the first Craig Brothers movies, and I'm a fan of the new one. I think I'm a Cray sucker. I like any movie about the craze. And in America, they really don't know so much about the craze. They're, they're way more famous here. So um, I'm eager to see how this movie does when it, when it comes to America. But I love the first one, but now that I've seen this one, I, I can't even remember the first one. And I always pick movies that I haven't seen for a long time because I want audiences to see them again. And I always think I'll get to see them again, but I never do because they have me scheduled to do something else when they're playing. But um, all the movies that um, I picked were completely from different genres, everything, because there's no genre I don't like. I mean, I think you can have a great commercial movie. I thought Mad Max was the best movie of the summer. You know, I don't dislike all Hollywood movies. But at the same time, a, a movie like Blue that we're going to see tonight, could that possibly be released today in America in the art house circuit? I think not. So I think we're very lucky to be able to see some movies that, that today um, you wouldn't get to see. You're getting to see them today, but even then they were hard to see and now almost impossible. Another couple of ones that almost made the grade. One was in the loop, uh, the Anandi uh, Which I just think that's one of the funniest movies ever. And then, of course, they did Veep, right? Yep. The TV show that uh, my friend Pat Moran just got her third Emmy win for it and, and for casting. And uh, it was all filmed in Baltimore and everything. So I'm a big fan of, of that movie. And there was also Joanna Hogg's film Unrelated as well. Yeah, I'm a big fan of her. I'm an art hag, too. You know, sometimes I, I like impenetrable art movies. And... Uh, <laughs> And Lincoln Center showed her movies, and that's where I first saw them, and I'm, I'm a big fan of hers, yeah. And we also, perhaps more predictably, had sort of, you'd been thinking about going a little bit further back to the 50s, 60s, and films like Beat Girl and some of those kind of Well, I love movies. all those movies, but I felt they were obvious choices. I felt that that would be, if you asked 10 people to program a festival here, they would pick that movie. So it seems uh, that probably this audience knows that movie and have seen that movie. So I just wanted to pick, I like Beat Girl too, but I just want to pick, even the Hitchcock movies I didn't pick, because nope. everybody's seen them. That's, that should be in a Hitchcock festival and everything. So I wanted to pick ones that were a little more outside the loop. And the other, and the other kind of sort of um, person, Peter Greenaway, the cook, the thief, his wife, and a lover, and two Norts. And I'm numbers. a huge fan of Peter Greenaway. I have all the soundtracks to his albums, which you can drive people crazy with playing those soundtracks. <laughs> but you want someone to leave, you have a party, put them on. <laughs> <laughs> And so um, I'm a big fan of Peter Greenaway's, but I just figured, I don't know, that, that everybody has seen him too, a lot of the movies. And so um, I just wanted to go back and pick some one that might not be as well known. Or, or of course, the one that you always ask me, who did I don't want, the tyranny of good taste, which is, of course, David Lean, the director I hate the most, I know, <laughs> uh, that, that he represents everything that I want to wipe out, you know, like the <laughs> tyranny of good taste. The, the, my mother loved his movies, right? Like, they were forced down my throat. It, it was almost child abuse of good taste. <laughs> The fact that you could say that on the British Film Institute <laughs> stage, and in fact, you know, you, <laughs> you actually... He doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a piece of artwork that you created called... Well, it was called Awful David Lean, and it was actually... <laughs> it, it was his credit on metal rumpled up, <laughs> thrown like... 
Yeah, I think, you know, every, I never say bad things about people, but every once in a while somebody, I make fun of Forrest Gump, or there's some people, they don't really care. They, I, I can't tarnish their reputation. So I say it almost in humor. Who is the one person you can never say anything against? And it probably is David Lean. Yeah, no, well, certainly in this country it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so moving on to the films that did make the grade the sick. So um, obviously Blue is the film we're going to... Well, um, Blue to me, you know, I, I talk about, you know, I love gimmicks in movies. I love Dogma 95. I love William Castle, who had buzzers under the seats. He had skeletons that came out on wires. And his last gimmick was just Joan Crawford herself sitting there. But uh, <laughs> and, and they promised him he wouldn't put any gimmicks. So he put seat belts on the seat in case they were shocked out of your seat. But in a way, Blue was a gimmick movie, in a way, uh, only in the more, most artistic way. I remember when I paid to see Blue, at, I think it was at the Cinema Village in New York or the, the, the Quad, I can't remember. But there were big signs all over the box of us, warning, this movie is only the color blue, because every person would come in if they didn't know what it was and get furious about it, you know? <laughs> but to me, it's hypnotic, it, it, it's a, absolutely beautiful film that's angry it's not it's not like blue is this relaxing thing you're going to watch but i remember maybe it's because i took a lot of acid anyway maybe i have flashbacks i don't know but it seemed to me watching this blue after a while i started hallucinating but but i think it came out right at the time when everybody was dying of aids i mean half my friends died of aids you know really so you look it's hard for that now to 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 remember that if you weren't around this terrible period where people died in a week if they got AIDS. When you went to visit them, you had to wear space suits and stuff. So, so young people today say, oh, they have pills for it. Well, believe me, they don't really. If you want to take a lot of pills, yes, it is better. But this was before when they had only the first medicine that was AZT that was kind of terrible and everything. So this, this film, and I was a huge fan of Dirk's, of all his movies before, and, and I think he liked gimmicks. He made a movie in Latin, come on. That, that's a gimmick, isn't it? A sexy movie in Latin. Uh, so, and, and you know, Tilda, who I love and I've met and everything, and she has the most radical fashion sense of all, to win an Oscar wearing no makeup. That is really radical. She had a full gown on and no makeup. That think, is really a radical look. I think you've look. been close to saying that you know, Tilda Swinton was kind of like Derek Jarman's divine. Well, I think she was. I think she was um, Derek's great superstar in a way, and I mean that as a compliment, certainly. And, um, and I think Tilda's so great in that new movie. What did I just see her in where she plays this editor of this magazine, and she's really almost unrecognizable. Anyway, to Diary of a Teenage Girl? Train wreck. Train wreck. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, so I, I only met Derek once for a second at a, at a bar at a party, but but this movie haunted me, and I, re I remember seeing it. it got all good reviews when it came out. Even as we were talking earlier, even in the the tabloid press that would rise to this bait, you would think they they didn't actually. And it's just amazing to imagine today in, in an art house environment, could this movie ever be released? And, uh, and I went to see it and it was crowded. You know, it was like people actually went. It wasn't a flop in any ways either. But it was the ultimate experimental movie. It was an artistic movie. It was a beautiful movie. It was an angry movie. It was a, almost a call to arms. And at the same time, a, a trippy movie. So I don't know. It's a genre of one. I don't think there is another genre that this movie. And you, and you call it, it the, rose, the rosebud of minimalist cinema. <laughs> well, it is in a way. Because it, it, it is entirely minimalistic. But it isn't because it goes into so many different. When you hear the talk, it's like poetry. It's anger. It's it's. it's sickness, it's, it's optimism, it's pessim it's, it, I don't know, it's, it's, it's really just a beautiful movie, I think. And I should say, um, it's, it's really great that today we've got James Mackay, who produced the film and worked with Derek Jarman um, over a long period of time, and Keith Collins, his partner. They're both here, and they're prepared to give a little wave or thumbs up. Yeah, there, yeah. Over there. <laughs> um, the, ver the version we're going to show is a, is a version that... that um, uh, James specially produced and we played in the IMAX quite recently um, and it's a pristine digital version with Dolby surround sound. It doesn't have the um, the, um, the titles at the um, beginning and the end which is why on the program notes you'll have all those there um, but it is absolutely the best version you could possibly see. But he was um, saying earlier the final the last movie version the print version of it is of course Scratch now that might be great too, really, <laughs> to see the blue with all the scratches. That, that is a different version. Maybe that's the, I don't know, like you, you restore the scratches. 
<laughs> so um, just in terms of the, the, the other five, which we're not going to watch now, but are playing as part of the season, um, what was the naked civil servant you've chosen? Which was so great. And I was having dinner the other night, and John Hurt was in the restaurant and came over. So, And I love this movie. When I first came to England, I had read about the naked civil servant. This is when Quentin still lived here. And I called him up. He had no idea who I was. I went to his little old flat that he had here with the, exactly like in the book. He was sitting there. He treated me just like a star, like anybody. He treated everybody, no matter who you were. Years later, when he'd become way, way more famous, and he was in New York, and I met him, and he had no recollection of me being over there that day. He said he didn't remember me at all coming, which was great, because he treated everybody that wanted to come up. He was fine. And um, I'm a huge fan of this movie. I think I think John's performance is amazing. And the second one I like, too, the sequel to it. What was that called? I can't remember what it was called yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, but he's amazing. And he, you know, it's almost like it, he is Grant Chris. I mean, it, there's so little difference. He catches him perfectly without ever condescending, without ever making any comment. He plays him as a hero that I think Quentin was. And very recently, for the very first time, you met Terence Davis here yeah. literally only a few days ago, and you've chosen Deep Blue Sea. Which is, to me, the, the best masochistical movie ever, you know, about being in, like, you want to leave the theater and wish somebody would break up with you. So, <laughs> so and, and, and Rachel's the star of it, when, when, who Daniel Craig is her partner now, and I was doing my Christmas spoken word show, and they came to visit me backstage in, in Buffalo, New York or somewhere, which I didn't even know they were coming, and I had just picked it as my favorite movie of the year in art form that had just come out, so it was great, you know, just they happened to be there. But it's an amazing movie. I'm a fan of all his movies, I think, but, but this one's my favorite, and this one, all the stuff, you know, you know, about living in the subways and all that stuff. It's just, I mean, in the tube is so amazing in the movie. And, and the performance is it's just an incredibly beautiful movie. That, that, um, and he has a brand new movie that just played in Toronto. It was received very well that I can't wait to see. One of the films that I think seemed to have definitely surprised people in the office when they were kind of researching the titles and going out and finding out where the best prints and stuff were was the, was the mother, Roger uh, Michelle's film. Well, I think Daniel Craig is so sexy in this. I mean, what would happen if your mother had an affair with, you know, the handyman that your daughter was dating, really. I mean, it is a shocking movie, and it's a funny movie, and, and he is great. It's really good. Everybody's great in it. It's a movie that, I don't know, was it a success here? Not, not a massive success. No, it wasn't thought. certainly a massive success either, but it did play in America, and I just always remembered liking it and finding it very erotic and thinking that he was amazing. When I met him, that's the first thing I said. It was that's your, my favorite movie with you, which I'm sure maybe isn't the <laughs> usual thing that people <laughs> bring up, but you never tell. Uh, we're talking about Boom, which comes next. I mentioned, finally, I met Elizabeth Taylor at her house, and I mentioned I love Boom, and she got mad. She thought I was making, <laughs> she thought I was making fun of her. She said, she said, that's a terrible movie. I said, it's not a terrible movie. I show, and then she calmed down a little bit. I mean, you, yeah. you've, <laughs> you know. you, I mean, you just mentioned, I mean, Boom is an astonishing film, isn't it? Well, it's, it's so perfectly awful and, it's, and great that it's confusing. You cannot imagine as you watch it this movie was made. And Tennessee Williams said it is the best work of art ever made from one of my books. He and I are the only people that ever said that. And my favorite is Boom. They didn't know how to release it. It had the worst ad campaign. It was the Milk Train Doesn't Stop Anymore, Hear More of the Play that at one point had Tab Hunter and Tallulah Bankhead in it on Broadway. And uh, so they added, they, it was called Boom, in the last minute ditch you know, marketing campaign, they added an exclamation point to the title. So in America, it's called Boom. In this country, <laughs> it's just Boom. But tonight, we're watching Boom. And, and it is astonishing when you watch this movie because Elizabeth Taylor's voice in it, she's very screechy. And, and she's too old, for, she's too young, but not old enough, and he's too young. It's sort of the wrong cast, but the set is so amazing. And I've read a lot of the books about the making of it, and Joseph Losey bragged he was the first to ever lose money with Richard Taylor, with, with Burton and Taylor together. And they started the day every day with drinking. So basically, they were drunk when they made this movie. And you can tell because they kept saying she wanted to buy the house. And they said, but Elizabeth, it's a set. There's no roof. <laughs> but she didn't care. <laughs> she wanted to live there. Which means, that I think, that there was a little too many you know, Bloody Marys in the morning. And, 
it, you just cannot believe your eyes when you see some of this. And Noel Coward plays the Witch of Capri, and in a lot of the books it said it was offered to Catherine Hepburn, who turned down the part, quote, insulted to have been asked. <laughs> <laughs> she never was any fun. Uh, and, and, you know, and it's just such an amazing movie because the tone of it is, you, you just can't believe it. And Rupert, Ever he played this, he did it as a, he played Sissy Goforth in a play that he did here of, after Boom came out. And Boom got the worst reviews ever. It was like, boom, the sound of a bomb exploding, you know, that kind of thing. But it, it has a fashionista. They all love the movie because the outfits are amazing. And I only met Carl Lagerfeld once, and he told me, he, I said, I love Boom, and I was showing it at the, at, it was, I think, at, anyway, some art festival. And it, the, cre the clothes are credited to Tarzania of Italy or some, of Rome or something. And I always wondered, who is that? And he said, I worked on that movie. I was his intern when we made Boom, Carl Lagerfeld. So it has pedigree, believe me. But, <laughs> but the dialogue, and every time a wave crashes, Richard Burton says, boom, the sound of knowing the next moment you're alive. So I cannot <laughs> stop saying that whenever I'm at the beach, <laughs> every time. And, I, you know, if, if you don't like the movie, I hate you. That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> Tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be here again, and we're going to be playing Trog. Trog, which I haven't seen since I paid to see it in whatever year it came out. 1970. 1970. That was right the year we were made Multiple Maniacs. Um, it is an astounding movie because Joan Crawford treats it as if this is she might win the Oscar on this movie. And this is... <laughs> a man in a rubber suit where she has dialogue, catch the ball, Trog. I mean, it, it, it is staggering to watch, and, but earnest. It's an yeah. earnest movie. And I think it's the final step out of all those whatever happened to Baby Jane, what happened to Baby Jane, die, die, every one of those movies that was made with a, with a you know, one-time big star who was in a horror or science fiction kind of version. But, um, we do have a surprise guest that's going to come that I'm not going to tell, but I think it should be exciting. So um, I'm happy to bring Trog back. Freddie Francis, who directed it, refused yeah. to ever put it on his credits or mention it out loud. And, and Joe Crump's always said she had to change her clothes in her car. She had no dressing room. And he said, that is a lie. I had to spend a fortune on her for that movie, for all the <laughs> dressing rooms and everything. So who knows the truth? I don't know. But no one was too eager to claim Trog, really, you know? It, but I think, did it do okay at the box office? No. I, no, I don't think it was, no. I don't think it was, it was one of the better received films in Freddie Francis' career, to be truthful. No, it no wasn't Joan better Crawford. received, but did people pay to see it? Was um, it a hit no, horror I, I couldn't movie? Tell you that, but I, I, I don't know. All I can say is it's it, it, it's rarely shown and uh, and has a very very cult following, which usually means no, it didn't. Well, a cult is, of course, the worst thing you can ever say in Hollywood. That means. <laughs> You know, it lost every penny and three smart people liked it. Yeah. <laughs> you never want to say the word cult when you're trying to raise money for a movie, I promise you. So we're going to move on, I think, and play the film. What I should just say, and this actually, I'd like to be able to kind of, sort of claim that we had this by design, but it's just by complete freak of coincidence, this is absolutely the day. The 9th of September, 1993, was the day that Blue was shown simultaneously on Channel 4 and Radio 3 with the broadcast. And it just has happened to work out. It's exactly 22 years to the day. Wow. Um, so one of those strange uh, twists of fortune. But it is fantastic that you've chosen it. Um, and what will happen very, very shortly, I think, if somebody will come down and take the microphones away, it might be about a minute or so, and then we're going to play the film. Watch, so, and I'll thank you for, you know, having the cinema balls to support movies like this. Really. A, a yeah. massive thank you to John Walter. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.